and we're going to see some examples of things that we can do using randomization that are not possible without it. So in the previous sessions, we've seen, for example, a randomized version of whipsort, but it wasn't asymptotically faster than a non-randomized version. So I'm going to start with an example where we actually need randomization, and we can prove that randomization really reduces the runtime. And the example is that what I call a minimax tree, or for our use cases, we can just call it an ad or tree. So what is this tree? This tree is basically not. So what is an um, what is a minimax tree? It's basically called something as a minimax tree. A minimax tree is a tree where every node is either a min node or a max node. And it's a full binary tree. And every min node has two max children, and every max node has two min children. are just zeros and ones, so if each leaf has just one bit of information in it, then taking min is basically the same as logical n. Right? And taking max is the same as logical o. So instead of talking about a min max tree, I can talk about an and or tree. So let's say I have an and or tree, and let's say that I start with an and level, and then I have an OR level, and then again I have an AND level, and so on. And at the end, I have a bunch of leaves, and these leaves are each 0 or 1. And uh, so I show this tree with T sub k, and what I mean here is that I have k AND levels and k OR levels. So whenever I write T sub K, that's a tree of depths 2K. Uh, okay. Can I ask, is it a big white or? Is it for the line? Is it a big white or? Yeah, that, this is big white or and this is big white. Okay. Now, uh, if I have a tree like this, how many leaves would I have? Yeah, well, the, the number of leaves, since it's a a full binary tree would be just 2 to the power of the height, but the height is 2k, so the number of leaves is 4 to the power of k. Now, what I want you to imagine is that these leaves are the input to our program, and the output of our algorithm should be the value of the root. But we don't want to read all the inputs, so imagine that reading input is really costly. For example, maybe this input is on some sort of old tiny tape, or maybe it's on a hard disk. It's not in our RAM. So reading the input actually costs something to us. And what we want to do is to minimize the number of bits of inputs that we actually need. Okay? So instead of analyzing the runtime, I'm analyzing the cost here, and the cost can be anything. In this particular case, I'm saying the cost is the number of leaves that I'm reading in here. So, let's think about deterministic algorithms with no randomization first. And let's see what they can do. 
So if I have an algorithm A, and let's say that this algorithm is not randomized, then what is the worst case runtime of A, or worst case cost of A? It's the number of leaps that my algorithm A has to read in the worst case. And what is the worst case over? It's over all possible inputs. So over all possible valuations of these things. It's very easy to come up with an algorithm that reads all the leaves and basically just starts from the bottom of the tree and finds the values for every node until it goes up and finds the value of the root. So we can definitely have an algorithm that has cost 4 to the k. And okay, this 4 to the k is also our size of input, so 4 to the k is also the same as n, which is our input size. So I can definitely have an algorithm that has cost n. But can I have a deterministic non-randomized algorithm that has cost less than 4 to the power? So is it possible for a deterministic algorithm to not read some of these leaves? and still give me the correct value. Intuitively, it seems like this shouldn't be possible, right? Because maybe that leaf that you didn't read actually had an effect on the answer of you. But can we be a little bit more formal? Maybe not entirely formal, but just a bit more formal about what a deterministic algorithm can do. So let's say I'm a deterministic algorithm. And let's say that I read this one here. Okay? So as soon as I read this one, since the parent is an OR node, I know that the value of this parent is going to be 1. So I don't need to read this 0 anymore. I don't care if it's really a 0 or a 1 or anything else. I don't need to read this leaf. I can, if I only read this leaf, I know the value. So in this case, this algorithm would be kind of lucky, right? Because it can read here and it sees that, oh, the value is one, so I decide I don't have to read. But now we can think of this as a game between an algorithm and some sort of adversary who gives us the inputs. So let's say that uh, there is an adversary, there is a devil, and the devil gives us the inputs. And he can change the input, but he cannot change the parts of the input that we have read. Right? So this is the same as saying I want to find the worst case for my algorithm. So if my algorithm tries to read, let's say, this leaf here, so the adversary knows that my algorithm hasn't read this other leaf. So it's better to put a zero here for the adversary, because then my algorithm would have less information. And then in order to find the value of even this node, my algorithm has to ask for another input. Okay? So let's say I'm an adversary like this. What can I do as the adversary? So the algorithm asks first for the value of some uh, node, some leaf node. And I know that the parents of all leaf nodes are OR nodes. So for the first value, I just say the answer is 0. OK? Now, what happens? So the value of this OR node is going to be the same as the value of this job. Right? So the algorithm has to ask for this one. But in my mental image as the adversary, I can just imagine that these two are the same nodes now because whatever value I give here is going to be used for here as well. So I can prune this, this tree from here, and I can prune this one as well, and then I can make this OR node into a new leaf. So from my point of view as the adversary, the algorithm can now ask the value of this leaf. But what is my technique? My technique is that whenever uh, the, the deterministic algorithm asks for the value of a leaf, I make sure that it cannot find the value of any other node except that leaf. So now this leaf has a parent that is an AND node. So if the algorithm asks me for the value of this leaf, I would say the value is 1, because I don't want 
the deterministic algorithm to be able to find the value of this one. Okay? So if I do this, I can ensure that by every question, the deterministic algorithm can only find the value of one of my nodes. And so, one of my leaves. So basically, each time that the deterministic algorithm asks for one value, the number of leaves goes down by one, and it only finds out the value of the leaf. It doesn't find any more information. So that ensures that no matter what this deterministic algorithm was trying to do, as an adversary, I could force it to ask 4 to the power of k questions. So any deterministic algorithm has to read all of these inputs. And so there is no deterministic algorithm that has a runtime better than 4 to the power of k or just But what happens if we have a randomized algorithm? So another way of looking at this when we are analyzing a deterministic algorithm is that instead of saying there is an adversary who chooses at every step what the input is going to be, we can say the adversary chooses at the very beginning. But he knows our entire algorithm, so he can choose the worst possible uh, input for our algorithm. Okay, but what happens if I have a randomized algorithm? If I have a randomized algorithm, then I can say flip a coin and ask for this one or this one. Right? And now, if the adversary has first chosen the input, he can't always give me the zero. It might be that my coin flip gives me the one. Okay, so that's why using randomization would give me a little bit more power. But can we come up with an algorithm that has actually an expected runtime that is less than 4 to the power of k? Let's see. So let's do the simplest thing possible. I have a root, and this root is an AND node. And I want to find the value of the root, whether it's 0 or 1. So what I do is that I flip a coin and I randomly choose one of the two children of the root. And I recursively find its value. Now, if I have the value of, let's say, this child, and the value is zero, then I don't need to go to this other child and find its value, because I have a zero here, and this is an AND node, so I can immediately say that this is also zero. Right? Now, the same thing also happens with an OR node. So let's say that I have an OR node here, and I have two of its children. And let's say I want to find the value of this OR node. What I do is that I just randomly take one of its two children with equal probability, and I evaluate that child. I find the value of that child. Now, if that value happens to be one, then again, I don't need to evaluate the other child. I can just say that here also the value is so the same idea that we had for a deterministic algorithm, but instead of looking at it from bottom up, we're looking at it top down. So now, what is the runtime here? What is the expected runtime? Let's analyze this. Uh, so analyze this one. Let's say that uh, okay, I need some notation here. Let me show C of k to be the cost uh, of evaluating a tree, tk, which basically has k and levels and k or levels. Okay. So what can I say about C of k if I want to write a recursion? Well, I have an AND node at the root, right? So I first randomly choose one of these two children. So there are two cases. Either the value of this AND node was supposed to be 1, or the 
value of this angle was supposed to be zero. So CK is the maximum of two cases. The first case is that uh, root's value is zero, and the second case is that root's value is one. So let's see what our cost is in any of these cases. So if our root's value is zero, since this, this was an AND node, it means that at least one of its two children is going to also be a zero. Okay? So when I choose a child, I choose it randomly. So if I just randomly choose a child and evaluate it, there is 50% chance that that child is going to be zero. And if that child is a zero child, then I don't have to evaluate the other child. Okay? So it's, I have half chance of evaluating only one child. Okay? So uh, I don't really have any notation for that, so I'm just going to write it like this, evaluating one child. And then I have another half chance of evaluating both children. Okay? And this was just my first case, the case where the roots value is zero. I also have a case where the roots value is one. But I will come back to that. And I'm really abusing notation. Okay, now, so what is this part? This part is that I know that the value here was zero, so I know that at least one of the children was supposed to be a zero, and I flipped the coin, chose one of the children, and I was lucky, and that child was really zero. So I don't have to evaluate the other child. But how much time did I spend evaluating this child that was zero? So this child, an OR node. And if its value is zero, the only way that I could know that is by evaluating both of its children. Right? But now these children, they are each T of K minus one, right? Because I've removed one AND level and one OR level. So this would be maximum on that. And here, I just have to evaluate two children. Right? What about the other case? So the other case is a bit nicer. So this value was zero. So I know that at least one of the children was zero. But I randomly picked some child, and I evaluated it. And this evaluation gave me a 1. So it's the second child that is giving me the zero that I need. Okay. But now again, let's go one level deeper, and these are those four nodes. Okay. So this is an OR node, and the value that it's giving me is zero. Right? So I definitely have to evaluate both of its children to know that that value is zero. Okay? But this one is an OR node, and it's giving me a value of one. So, again, what I can say is that on average, how many of its children did I have to evaluate? So it might be that both of its children were one, it might be that both of them, uh, only one of them was one and one was a zero and so on, okay? But here's the thing, what is my worst case? So I'm choosing some child and I'm evaluating it. And if that child is a one, then I'm happy, right? So my worst case is not the case where I have both children to be one. My worst case is when I have a zero and a one. But if I have a 0 and a 1, then a 
again, what is the probability that I pick the zero first? It's just a half. And if I pick the zero first, then I also have to evaluate the one. But if I pick the one first, then I don't have to evaluate the zero. Okay. So now this is the case where I was evaluating both of these children. On this side, I had to evaluate two. On this side, with probability half, I had to evaluate one, and with probability half, I had to evaluate those. So this would be half times t k minus one plus half times two k minus one. So it would just be one. okay. And we still have the case where the roots value. Plus. Okay, what is this? So I have t k minus one here. What do I have here? I have two, uh, two, three, three and a half, and then half of that. So, okay, three and a half divided by two, or seven fourths of t k minus one, and I'm adding it there, so it's like eleven fourths. Hopefully, I did the math correctly. So this is eleven fourths of t k minus. What is the other case? The other case is that my roots value is 1. Okay? If my roots value is 1, then what are my cases? Okay. If the value of the root is 1, then the only way that I could possibly know that was that I evaluated both of these children, and both of them gave me a 1, because the root is an and node, so both of these have to be 1, okay? But if this is a 1, then again, the worst case is that one of its children is 0 and one of its children is 1, right? So the cost that I have here is that with probability half, I'm going to find the right child, and with probability half, I have to evaluate both of these children. So my overall runtime is two, and this two is because I have to analyze both of the two sides times. Now, in each side, there is a probability of a half that I just have to do tk minus one. Right, I have to do only one. And there is a probability of a half that I have to do both of them. So this would be one half times two. Oh, I, I'm sorry. My notation is a bit wrong. So I was supposed to use c instead of d more. Yeah, so t is the tree, c is the cost of evaluating the tree. I'm sorry, I, I wrote all of these with t. But okay, just in your mind, replace all of these t's here with c. Okay. So this is one half times two times the minus one. Okay. And what does this fix? Um, okay, so I can just get rid of the one half and this two here, and this gives us three t k minus one. Right. So my cost is a maximum of 11 fourths of 2 t k minus 1 and 3 t k minus 1. Yeah. But again, all of the t's should be c's because the t was supposed to be the 3 and c of k was supposed to be the cost of evaluating the 3 with parameter k. So here I'm in the cost. So let me just fix the very last part. But do it in all of that as well. I'm not too lazy to go back. Oh, 
Okay, and of course 3 is larger than 11 fourths. So what we have is that CK is at most 3C n minus 1. It says that the, the cost for evaluating a tree of size k is at most three times the cost of evaluating a tree of size k minus one. So I can easily deduce from this that the cost for evaluating a tree of size k is three to the power of k times something. Actually, I think it's exactly 3 to the power of k. So if you find the value for k equal to 1, you can find this exactly. But I don't really care about the constants. I just care about the own notation here. OK? So what does this show us? We saw that the best possible deterministic algorithm, no matter what kind of deterministic algorithm you have, would need to evaluate all the 4 to the power of k things. But now, with a simple randomization, I have an algorithm that only needs to evaluate 3 to the power of k things. And this is an expectation. But what this shows you is that uh, randomization truly has some power. You can really do some things with randomization that you cannot do without. And by the way, so we said that we said 4 to the power of k is n, because that was the size of our input. So if this is O of 3 to the power of k, this is basically O of n to the power of log of 3 in base 4. Right? So I don't have to really even read all of my inputs. I can basically just read this much of the inputs. And let me see what this log of 3 in base 4. 0, 1, 7, 9, 2. better by using randomization, but I don't even have to read all of the inputs. I just have to read this much of the input. And of course, if n is large, this is a huge signal in comparison with having to read all. OK. Now, deterministic algorithm. So we said that any deterministic algorithm cannot do better than 4 to the power of k. Then we found a randomized algorithm that actually does much better. Now the question is, can we find a bound, a lower bound, on the runtime of any randomized algorithm? So can I, for example, say that this is optimal? And I can't have a randomized algorithm with better runtime than this. Actually, this is optimal, but the bound that I'm going to find for you today is not going to be exactly this, because showing that it's optimal is a bit harder. But let's say I want to find some lower bound, and I want to say that no matter what you do with your randomized algorithm, you have to read at, me at least these many things. Now, to do that, we actually have to borrow some techniques from game theory. So I'm just going to teach you some of the very basics of game theory, just as much as we need here. Uh, Just specify. 
classified by matrix. So you have a matrix of numbers. And the idea is that suppose that you have two different players, and these two players work at the same time. And one of the players chooses a row of the matrix, and the other player chooses a column of the matrix. And then the number that is written at that row and that column is the amount of money that goes, let's say, to the row player, from the column player to the row. So, as a very simple example, we can consider a game of rock, paper, scissors. So, my rows would be rock, paper, and scissors. So, these are the strategies that the first player can play. And my columns will also be rock, paper, and scissors. And these are the strategies that the second player can play. Now, if both players play rock, no one gets anything. If both players play paper, also the same. But if one player, if the row player plays paper and the column player plays rock, then the row player wins. So I show that with the one. So I, the rule I'm thinking about is that whenever I win a game of rock, paper, scissors, my opponent will pay me one row. Now, on the other hand, if the row paper plays rock, and the column paper plays, and column player plays paper, then this would be minus one. Right? So I'm looking at these payoffs from the point of view of the player that is choosing the rows. Okay? So if I play rock and the opponent plays scissors, I win. If I play paper and the opponent plays scissors, I lose. If I play scissors and the opponent plays rock, I lose. If I play scissors and the opponent plays paper, I win. Okay. So this is called uh, a zero sum matrix thing. And so the reason that we say zero sum is because uh, the sum of the payoffs for the two players is always zero. So either I win and then my opponent has to give me one dollar, which means that my opponent is losing exactly as much as I want or we have a draw and no money is going to change it. So consider a zero sum matrix game like this. And let's say that you are the role player. What's the best that you can do? So normally, you're going to choose one of these three strategies. And what you can say is that I'm going to choose the best possible strategy. But what is the best possible strategy? So in the worst case, what you can assume is that your opponent knows what you're going to choose. Okay. So for me, let's say that I'm the row player, and I want to maximize my total payoff. So I want to take the maximum over all possible strategies for myself, which are either rock or paper or scissors. And then what I actually gain is the minimum over all possible strategies uh, S for the other player. And then let's say this matrix is A, I just get A minus or maybe I can just call it J. So this is the payoff that I can definitely guarantee for myself as player one. Now we can do the same analysis from the point of view of the other player, from the point of view of the player who's choosing the columns. So if I'm the player who's choosing the columns, I want to have the smallest possible uh, number chosen. So I choose a strategy J that minimizes uh, the amount of this A of J. But after I choose my strategy J, the other player can choose the strategy I. Okay? So from the point of view of the player who's choosing the rows, this is the best uh, payoff that he can guarantee. This is the highest payoff that 
the role player can benefit. From the point of the point of view of the player who's choosing the uh, columns, this is the best payoff that can be guaranteed, and this is basically the lowest payoff that they can get. Now, what are these values? What are these values in this example? So this one is minus one, and this one is one. Right. No. So here, what's happening is that as the role player, I'm choosing I, and after I choose I, the column player can choose J based on the I that I have chosen. So in that sense, it's like as the role player, I'm telling the column player, for example, I'm playing scissors. And then the column player can, based on that information, decide to play whatever makes, makes me lose. So this would become minus one. And here, it's the exact opposite. So as the column player, I'm telling the role player what I'm playing. And then the role player is deciding. OK. So in this case, these two values are, of course, not the same. Yeah, isn't the operator of your eyes should uh, take it? Sorry, I don't hear you. Yeah, sorry, the, isn't the operator on your eyes should take it first? Yeah. Okay, the yeah. main operator should oh, like, yeah. minimize yeah. the yeah. Maybe the rest of it is different. Yeah, we should put a map closer to the AI chain. So then the map takes first, and then we take it. No, this is, uh, so in this case, the role player is first making a choice. And he's making the choice that is supposed to maximize his payoff. But he doesn't know the choice of the other player. So his payoff would be the minimum over all J of A of J. So the column player here is choosing after the role player. Maybe he means you could put back after the mean so that it's easier for us to understand. No, that would be a different thing. Right. Basically, this J can depend on I. But I is chosen without knowing J. And here, it's the opposite. Here, the I can depend on the J. Okay. So, in this case, the two are not the same. And generally, you can easily find games where the value that one player can guarantee and the value that the other player can guarantee are not really the same. But what happens if we can add randomization here? So instead of saying that the role player just chooses one of these three strategies and plays that, let's say that the role player chooses a probability for playing each of these strategies. And let's say that the column player also chooses a probability. Okay? So if I show the set of all probability distributions over RPS with delta of RPS, so delta of RPS is basically the set of all functions that assign different probabilities to R, P, and S such that the sum of the probabilities is one. Okay? So here, what I can do is that I can say, if I am the row player, what I can do is now I can choose a strategy, but my strategy can be randomized, or it can be mixed in the language of game theory. So I can choose some, let's call it delta i, which is in that sense delta. And then the other player can also choose a randomized strategy. Let's call that delta j. And then what I want is the expected value of a i j, assuming that a is taken according to delta, and, 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 and assuming that i is taken according to delta i, and j is taken according to delta j. Okay. So now, instead of saying that I'm the 
role player and I tell you what I'm going to play, I'm just going to tell you the probabilities. I'm going to tell the other player, hey, here are the probabilities that I would play rock or paper or scissors. So my strategy is now a set of probabilities. And then the other player can choose probabilities for themselves on how they want to play this. And then, of course, the expected payoff is the expectation of the value of the matrix, assuming that each player plays according to that uh, distribution that they choose. Okay? And on the other hand, I can do the same thing here. I can say that the, the column player can first choose some strategy delta j, and then the row player can choose the strategy delta i, and now the row player strategy can depend on the column player strategy. And then what we get is the expected value Assuming that i is sampled from delta i and j is sampled from delta j. Okay. Now, what are these values for this particular data? So, all we did was that we changed the way that the players play, and instead of them just committing to one strategy, they're now committing to a randomized strategy. Can you compute these two values? I mean, it's rock, paper, scissors. What's the best you can do in rock, paper, scissors? Yeah, so the best thing you can do at rock, paper, scissors is to play uniformly at random. So if you play uniformly at random, so if uh, delta i is just R with probability a third, P with probability a third, and S with probability a third, then the best thing that the other player can play against you is to also play uniformly. And then this expected value would be zero, because if you both play random, it's just the, the, the expected value of the payoff for each person is going to be zero. But this is the same as that, so these two become the same, and both of them are actually zero. Now, a theorem that I will not prove, what I will use, is what we call uh, von Neumann's minimax theorem. And what it says is that for any game, for any matrix game, this equality holds. And it's not, uh, now in this particular game, we had the same set of strategies for both players, but we, we don't have to have that either. It might be that one player has only two strategies and the other player has five strategies. And the size of the matrix can be any size. But this equality always holds. 